Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face, you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Hello there. Welcome to Girls on Film, the film review podcast from a female perspective. I'm your host, Anna Smith, and I'm recording this in April 2020. This episode is our fourth isolation pod recorded in our virtual studio during lockdown. Today I'm speaking to film director Carol Morley about her Friday Film Club, and I'll be reviewing new digital releases with fellow critic Jane Crowther, who's the editor-in-chief of Total Film magazine. Plus, we'll be speaking to some of you listeners who've been reading along with us as part of our Little Women Book Club with Sony. My first guest is director, screenwriter and producer Carol Morley, who made the films Dreams of a Life, The Falling and Out of Blue. She's also recently launched Friday Film Club, and we recorded this last Tuesday before her latest film club choice, Boarding House Blues. As with everything at the moment, we are recording this in our homes, so you might also hear a big meow from my cat, Ozymandias. Well, hello, Carol Morley. Welcome back to Girls on Film. Thank you. It's great to be kind of with you. You were with us in person in episode two, I think it was, quite some time ago. And now we've got you back because we're in isolation. We're all doing kind of interesting things. And something that really grabbed my attention, which you did very early on, was Friday Film Club. Tell us more about that. So I think it was really shortly after we were all told we can't go out. And I thought, I'm really going to miss being at the cinema with strangers, really, and other people. And um, I think I, I did a tweet in my panic and said, how would people feel about me starting a film club? And I think I got like about 400 likes, which is quite a lot for me. And, uh, and then I thought, oh, I better do it now. What I really wanted to do is create something where people could watch wherever they were. So we've had people in Italy, people getting up early in New Zealand, about 7 a.m. So it's quite international, the film club. And all the films are legal to watch and have fallen out of copyright for one reason or another. I was trying to make something where people didn't feel obliged to join a streaming platform or, or to have to pay, because times are tough, I think, economically as well. Yeah, so the first one I chose was Ida Lupino's The Bigamist. Now, Ida Lupino's films uh, are all in the public domain, pretty much. And she's an incredible director who came out of acting. I didn't want to choose anything too dark. And some of her films are darker, like The Hitchhiker that she made, a film noir. She specialised in film noirs. And The Bigamist really is a film noir where the marriage is the crime. <laughs> and so one of the rules, the only rule, really, of film club well, maybe two. One is to talk about it. And the other one is to watch it. So we don't tweet along or anything like that. We, we all watch the film and afterwards we come onto Twitter using hashtag Friday Film Club and uh, talk about the film, discuss it. And then you can find everybody's tweets about the film using that hashtag and I'll retweet people. So the discussion about Ida Lupino is fantastic because many people were discovering her for the first time, a very significant woman director um, who was ahead of her time, definitely. So as a director yourself, has this experience made you think about how people consume cinema particularly? Has it, has it brought any new sort of observations to light? Well, I think as a filmmaker and a film goer, <laughs> um, someone that loves going to the pictures or going to the cinema, I, I think what the lockdown has reminded me of is more than ever is how we need stories told in many ways and particularly through cinema and that the act of going to a cinema itself and all that entails you know walking through the door buying your ticket maybe buying something to eat to go along with the film or not to sit in a room with strangers people you, maybe you've gone with a friend maybe you've gone on your own but you're with an audience made up of people you don't know then the lights coming down and sharing together in that story 
is such a special experience and I think watching a film at home is a, is a very different experience when you're watching it. I mean, I find I'm often a little more distracted. I might stop the film. I might go and get a drink in the middle of it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the, the feel of Friday Film Club that I wanted to bring about was this sense that we are all in it together. We're all watching exactly at the same time. And I really found that my attention to the film shifts when I know that everyone is watching with me and I'm watching with everyone else. And the whole Friday Film Club has reminded me of the actual importance of films to our connection to each other and the importance of cinemas to bringing us together. I have always believed that the best place to see a film is in a cinema, to see it projected, to see it larger than life, to hear it with the best sound. I know that's not possible for everyone all of the time and it's certainly not possible now <laughs> so hashtag Friday Film Club is a way of kind of bringing uh, the experience a little bit closer to us in these times. It's been so interesting as you said to see how people have responded to this and other film clubs and the idea of watching it all together and I've loved reading all the comments particularly for Portrait of a Lady on Fire which you did recently which of course is one of my favourite films in recent years it was so wonderful to see that other people had been discovering this at the same time as each other and there was something very powerful in that experience. Yeah, absolutely. And Portrait of a Lady on Fire is, is of course, not in the public realm. Mubi kindly uh, gave me lots of passes for people to be able to, to watch the film and to join Mubi for three months for free. I mean, obviously, like some people were seeing it for like the fifth time. <laughs> They'd seen it on release before the lockdown because Portrait of a Lady on Fire was a film that was affected by the UK lockdown because it was in release then the, yeah there were people discovering it that night and we were all together and I think the conversation afterwards went on for hours <laughs> it was fabulous it was fabulous to some people even said I wouldn't have seen a film like this it wouldn't have been my natural choice and I'm just so excited to see it and, and it is it's an, an incredible film but that shared it's a film that you really do want to discuss afterwards and a lot of people that are part of Friday Film Club are living on their own. So they were able to take part in this conversation that they might not have been able to have at all immediately after with everyone that's watched it. And I wanted to say for our listeners that we actually also have a three month deal with Movie just for the listeners and we'll be letting them know how to get onto that at the end of the show. So we love Movie. <laughs> yeah, we love Movie. If they haven't yet seen Portrait of Lady Far, then that is the one to go for. What else have you got coming up? The one we showed last week is Sherrard, the Stanley Donan film with uh, Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn made in 1963. And what's fascinating about that film is it came into the public domain because the graphic artist or <laughs> the people that should have checked, it didn't have the correct copyright notice on it. Uh, so it fell into the public domain as soon as it was released. So Sherrard was the last one we showed. We also showed a 1937 original Star is Born by William Wellman. And people hadn't seen that and were really surprised by it. It's an absolutely brilliant film. And um, the sixth one that's coming up is something I found that I'd never seen or heard of before. It's not maybe the best recorded film of its time, and it's certainly suffered over the years, but it's called Boarding House Blues from 1948. And it stars Jackie Moms Babley, um, who was really the first stand-up comedian of her day from the 20s on. And really the film is about the vaudeville artists of their time that were very overlooked. It's an African-American cast and they were very overlooked in Hollywood and in the you know largely white film industry. And um, they are tenants of a boarding house and they put on a show to save the house. So I'm definitely showing a real range of, of films. <laughs> Let's have a listen to a clip. Take it away, Luther. Wait, wait a minute, Luther. Don't, don't play it like that. Play it like you're playing for one of them big people, you know. Make it pretty and one of them symphonic stuff, all that stuff. Hey, honey, make me look like Lena Horne if you possibly can up there, Mr. Lightfair. That's better, baby. Come on, Luther. Knock me out, Luther. Fine, fine. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a very varied selection, but in addition to all the variety, I think there is a theme here, and that is really interesting female characters and perhaps some women involved behind the scenes. Is that a conscious decision for you, or is it just naturally what you would pick out? There are ideas running through the picks. There are ideals running through it as well, but I think that when I look at it, I, I, I understand that there are... Uh, I think in every film there's a powerful lead character. I think there's many films directed by women. There's inclusivity in all the films. But it's not really why I chose them. It is because that would be my natural inclination. But you will see a lot of these films, they've not been excluded, but they're, they're not the, they're necessarily the known films. So that will always be my... Uh, <laughs> thrust, if you like, in both my own filmmaking and in selecting films that I'm going to have a a position, you know, and um, the more that you can get into a position where you can pick things and show things and curate things and make things, and the people behind that are people that maybe have a different view than uh, the, the sort of white male one, <laughs> uh, then you're going to see different things. So I think it's a, it's a natural thing. I think you do definitely have to look harder in the public domain for, for films directed by women. Sadly, that's when you realise how few women have directed films historically and when they did how many have actually disappeared I mean they're not even available they don't even exist they were left to rot so it's great to feel that in a small way you can readdress that if you can. Well we're right behind that as you well know. Carol you mentioned your own films um, if people want to see some of your fabulous oeuvre while they're sitting at home is there anything available online currently? So on um, BFI Player, there's a lot of my films for free, uh, a lot of short films, some longer films are free, and, and all my films are on BFI Player for UK people. Um, and I think in America, Out of Blue, the last film I made with Patricia Clarkson, is available on Hulu. Uh, I think all my films you can find online legally brilliant probably illegally too you also cast of course um florence Pugh in the falling which is a fantastic film and um she's now of course most recently appeared in little women which is coming out on digital on may the 11th i wondered if you were a fan of that film and you how you felt about her rise to fame well, I didn't just cast uh, Florence Pugh. I discovered her. There you go. I stand corrected. <laughs> well, no, we have to have that in the, uh, in the in the history books. So Florence Pugh, when I was making The Falling, which is set in 1969 in the girls' school, and I was looking for a particular cast, very particular, as all directors do. And so we searched far and wide for the actor to play Abby. And we looked at uh, all the girls' schools in Oxfordshire, which we were going to film in Oxfordshire and Shaheen Beg, uh, the casting agent, put out leaflets in the Oxfordshire area and I watched a lot of hundreds and hundreds of one minute videos of young girls and Florence Pugh was one of them and I've still got her, her tape actually which I sent her now and again to remind her. <laughs> Florence Pugh at her audition was a complete natural. I got all the girls to tell stories, I brought in objects and they told stories because I think if you can tell a story and captivate someone without training which you know obviously Florence was straight out of school or st still in school then you've really got something and what Florence had from the beginning was a, an innate ability to tell a story and to to put herself literally into the picture you know in this incredibly believable way and she's got real real instincts so it was kind of pretty clear even from her first audition that she was gonna uh, be very significant so for me to see her rise, and it's really a quick rise, it's only about four years, uh, it's really amazing because I think that her career will be on par with a kind of Meryl Streep career, I think, where she'll just have brilliant parts because she, she has something so different about her. And uh, she's quite uncompromising in her choices as well. So I think she's going to have just this amazing career and bring us and just so many people so much pleasure. But I also think it's also an example of if you are given opportunity, what you can do with it. And I think the fact Florence has had so many opportunities put before her and made so much with them is really brilliant. But I just really hope that many other young actors out there, all actors, actors of different ages, are given the possibility of playing varied roles and given the possibility of being in a film and 
whoever they are representing a character that they love in a film. And so, yeah, uh, Florence in Little Women was, was uh, uh, she, uh, to me, for me, she was the best thing in it. <laughs> I loved her in it. And we're also um, doing a Little Women book club, actually, encouraging people to read the book. Are you a fan of the book? I, I read it so long ago now. And, you know, you forget what came first. But I think I've seen all the all the Little Women adaptations and read the book when I was younger. And I think it's one of those books, isn't it, that you, you just take to your heart when you're a teenager. It's just sort of something that you live with, really. But it's great when, um, when films draw people back to the actual books. I, I, I like that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, what else are you working on? Are you are you just consumed with Friday Film Club in lockdown, or are you got other plots afoot? <laughs> well, I do I do have kind of panic attacks that I might never make another film again because <laughs> we might not uh, be allowed to get close enough to each other again. Of course, oh. this is not true, and we will be making the films again because everybody needs films. Uh, so, about ten days ago, I finished my second draft of the film which will be in my next film and it's called Typist Artist Pirate King and it concerns uh, the life and times of Audrey Amos who was a real woman and she was brilliant. <laughs> uh, she was an artist, a typist, a pirate and a king uh, which is what she called herself in her passport, Typist Artist Pirate King and she is just such a character. I've written about her for The Observer actually so people could could find, if they to search my name in The Observer they can they can find reference to her. So I, I've, I've just delivered it's that. It's a fantastic story. It's really excited about this. Yeah, story. I don't know how much to say really, but uh, especially I can't really say too much about the script because it's so different than my first draft that the, the financiers might hear this before they read it. <laughs> so I have to be a bit cloak and dagger. Uh, but Audrey is the central character and she's, she's amazing. And she, I think, I did ask her, she was born in Sunderland in the 1930s. In the 50s, she went to the Royal Academy to study painting. And uh, towards the end of her time there in the fourth year she had a very serious um, psychotic breakdown and was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and spent her whole life as a revolving door psychiatric patient while uh, earning her daily bread as she called it as a typist and, and keeping up her art so she's just this incredible woman very funny and kept diaries and um, when her nephew and niece went in a house they found 50,000 sketches undiscovered work that was all given to welcome in London and she kept scrapbooks of everything she ever ate so I, I it's a portrait of her but told in a way I think will really connect her to people very very brilliant woman unknown should be known I like bringing unknown women to the forefront. <laughs> Bravo, Karen Molly, that's fantastic. Um, listen, have you got any messages for our lovely listeners who are stuck at home, and I'm sure many of whom follow your work? Well, I'm, gl I'm glad, Anna, you're still out and about, <laughs> virtually. <you>. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and everyone's listening to you. I think that during lockdown, we must all remind ourselves that it will not be forever. You know, it's been very difficult times and obviously for some more than others. You know, people have lost people, uh, people have lost work and all sorts of things are going on that we don't know yet, the outcomes. But I do feel the positive thing and we all have to, you know, feel some positivity to it all is that I think we've all been reminded of how important we are to each other. And I think that if anything can come out of it, I think it will be more kindness, more respect, more feeling of how much we all matter to each other. And let's face it, the, the key workers at the moment are the NHS workers. So people are also reminded that entertainment is crucial and it's important for people's lives, but it's not the number one thing. <laughs> you know, everybody's equally important in keeping the world going and we should value people that have not been given their due. <laughs> And I myself, I'm hoping to do Q&As with typist, artist, Pirate King in the future and meeting you all properly <laughs> again. That would be wonderful. Well, I hope you can come back on Girls on Film and we'll celebrate that moment. Definitely, with a lots of alcohol. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I look forward to it. Carol, thank you so much for joining us on Girls on Film. It's always such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care, darling. Greta Gerwig's Little Women is set for digital release on May the 11th and you can own it from May 25th. To celebrate this, we're taking part in Sony's Little Women Book Club. We're aiming to read Louisa May Alcott's novel together in time for the film's release, and we've been asking you to share your thoughts on social media with the hashtag Little Women Book Club. 
Last week on the show, we had a mother and daughter duo, Caroline and Hannah Flint, and we asked you to get in touch with your thoughts on the book. I'm pleased to say we have three listeners on the line now, including another mother and daughter, Laurie and Julia. So let's start with our youngest listener who's in the UK, and that is 13-year-old Hannah. Hello, Hannah. Hiya. Thank you so much for joining Girls on Film. Yeah, it's lovely to be here. Now, you've been inspired by our Little Women Book Club and you've started reading the book. What do you think of it so far? I'm quite enjoying it, actually. Um, Although it's a bit more old fashioned than what I'd usually read, I think the message is really good, especially Jo, who is obviously quite a feminist. I think that her approach to everything, despite it being so long ago, it makes it almost more relevant because she has a much more modern approach. Would you call yourself a feminist, Tana? Yeah, I definitely believe in equality um, and I try to do whatever I can to get that. Excellent. What do you think that you and your friends are kind of the issues that you're facing as young women today that are similar, you know, the kind of obstacles that you might have in life? I mean, I think although the pay gap is not as wide as it was, it is still a thing and it might not affect me, but I don't know what my friends are going to go on to be. Um, I don't know if they're going to want to be a professional footballer, say, and I don't want that to have to get in the way of them, like, achieving what they want to achieve. And you're a fan of Greta Gerwig's film, Little Women? Yes, yeah, yeah. I went to see it in the cinema and it had a very good effect on me. It's quite an emotional film and you can really empathise with the characters And I think acting's great. Hannah, as a teenager, are there any other films that you've been enjoying recently? So I watched, this sounds really, really cheesy, but I've got a really little sister and I watched the new Trolls film and I was kind of pleasantly surprised. I watched that last night, actually, funnily enough, Trolls World Tour. Yes, um, yeah. I quite enjoyed it. It, I mean, they're they're so colourful and fun escapism. Yeah. But it's ideal for watching with a young person. You're right, if you've got a much younger sister, then that's kind of perfect. But again, it's kind of bright and fun escapism, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely good to watch films that are a bit more happy and upbeat at the moment when everything's a bit miserable. Perfect. Thank you. Do stay on the line and feel free to join in the conversation with our... We have some people on the line from Holland now. So we've got um, Laurie and Julia. Hello to you both. Hi there. Hey there. So you've been to some live Girls on Film events in Rotterdam, haven't you? Yes, we have. It's, it's great to have you actually on the show this time. Um, let's start with Laurie. Um, what's your relationship with the book, Little Women? So I found when I was a kid a book report that my mother uh, wrote on it. And she found it very fascinating when she was a young teenager. So then she gave me the book like a children's version. So I first read the book as a children's version. Then as a teenager for school, I read the, the normal version. And then, of course, I saw saw the movies. It's a, very much a favorite. So it's gone down the generations. And so, Julia, how about yourself? How do you feel about the book? Well, yeah, so it's also a, a it's been passed down another generation to me, uh, <laughs> probably because of my mom's interest. And I think we as a family have been able to relate to it because I have a sister as well. And my mom is a single mother. And although... Marmy is not necessarily a single mother. She is a single mother, you know, functionally. And so I think that's why it resonates so much uh, for us. That's an interesting point. Now, Laurie, did you relate to Marmy in the books um, strongly? I was thinking, hey, I used to relate to Joe. <laughs> now I relate <laughs> to Marmy. How interesting is that? <laughs> it's great. It kind of follows you through your life and there's still someone to, to relate to. That's really interesting. I love that we've got three people on the line of all different ages, you know, enjoying this book very much. Julia, why would you encourage people to read or reread the book now in the build up to the film's release on digital? Uh, One of the themes in the book and in the story in general, that's still really important. And that I think a lot of people forget is that for women, there should be a wide range of paths that are acceptable. You know, and I think the book really emphasizes that because each of these sisters has their own type of ambition, uh, but they're different and they want different things. And I think that that's a a really interesting point made in the book, that every kind of type of ambition is recognized as something that's appropriate for women. That's right. It doesn't judge people, does it, um, for wanting different things out of life? 
Um, I'd like to come back to Hannah now, actually. Has starting to read the book made you want to finish it? And will you tell your friends about it? I think I will, because I definitely think that it has so many great messages. The fact that they're all allowed to have their own ambitions and there's not one thing that a woman's meant to do. Although it's definitely set in a different time frame, I think there are some morals that you can get from it. I think it's definitely still interesting. Well said. Laurie, revisiting the book again after presumably quite a long time, did you see anything else with fresh eyes and sort of rediscover elements of it? Um, Well, it it just reminded me, I guess, why I liked it uh, so much, even when I was younger. I was definitely raised to be the better version of yourself. And I think uh, all these girls, you know, were allowed in a whole different generation, right, to be the best, best virgins versions of themselves and be somewhat a little bit rebellious maybe in in that generation and different from their friends and i think that is what still is relatable so maybe not new but i sort of remembered why i like it so much do you like the idea of reading a book and knowing that lots of other people are reading it at the same time hannah yeah i do because i think it's a lot better when you can share something with someone and then you have that discussion as to what they thought and then it makes you think more about what it, the story was actually telling you. Well, just the joy of reading is that I always am so amazed, especially with this book, but with other books too, at the ability to convey, um, convey familial warmth the way that Louisa May Alcott does and the way the movies do as well. And I think that that makes this as a collective readings experience really appropriate because it's it's another form of community and another form of warmth. Yeah, definitely. I think people that now are sharing time home again with their families, it's a whole different, you know, way of thinking and kind of focusing on on what is important. And I think how these people, you know, how the how the family, how these girls with their mother are at home and how they care for others and about uh, each other but also fight with each other and also, you know, disagree. It's very much what, you know, we can learn from again now that we're all sitting in our homes together. It's so true. Oh, it's been such a pleasure to speak to you all. Thank you, Laurie, Julia and Hannah. Thank you so much for being Girls on Film. Thanks. (laughs) Thank Thank you. you. If you'd like to join the Little Women Book Club and read along with us, then please follow us on Twitter and hashtag Little Women Book Club. Please also include at Sony Picks at Home and at Books Under GRND. Enjoy reading Little Women and in a couple of episodes time, I'll be reviewing Greta Gerwig's film with two fabulous film critics in time for the digital release on May the 11th. Well, Jane Crow, the editor-in-chief of Total Film magazine, welcome back to Girls on Film. Thank you very much for having me. Well, I think we last had you on the pod in episode 10 when we were up in Manchester, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great that. Um, so much sort of enthusiastic people that had turned up on the night. It was uh, it was really good fun. But it's just us two now. It's just us two. <laughs> Hopefully some of those people are listening. It's, still, it's nice I still meet people from Manchester who needs to come to our live events up there. So hello to anyone from Manchester. Uh, so you're going to join me for a few reviews of digital releases that people can watch at home now. And the first one is the rhythm section. Reed Morano directs a spy thriller starring Blake Lively as a bereaved woman trying to avenge her family and also stars Jude Law. Let's have a listen to a clip first. I'm going to say this once. Even if you succeed, it won't be worth it. I'll make you a three. He's walking the streets. You promised me you won't do nothing silly. Why are you here? To offer your closure. And how would you do that? Jane, I thought it was excellent to see a female spy character from Ian Productions, who obviously do the Bond films. I felt it was obviously much more small budget and quite serious, but some groundbreaking aspects. Uh, what did you think of it? I really wanted to like this film because, as you say, it's it's from Barbara Broccoli, the producer of the James Bond franchise. 
we've seen a lot of men doing this role. And we have seen, you know, Charlize Theron do it with Atomic Blonde, which was sort of quite tongue in cheek and very sort of retro. This is very gritty, but I just didn't think it quite worked. And like the Bond series, it's it's adapted from a series of books. And this feels very much like the sort of origin story and that they intended for there to be more of this. But obviously box office when it came out very briefly at the cinema wasn't great. And I just I'm not sure it actually works as an origin story or indeed as just a a one off. It's not quite there for me. It's not quite interesting enough. And I say that with great sadness because I love the idea of it, um, which is this woman who is driven by absolute grief and rage and revenge, teaching herself to be an assassin and it being so gritty but it just felt really grim. I don't know how you felt about it, but it just felt like there was no respite from the grimness. And that I found quite difficult to latch onto emotionally. That's right. There was no levity. I think, I mean, it can be a serious subject and still have a sense of humour, as we've obviously seen with the Bond films and many a spy thriller. And I did, well, I was sort of hankering after something a little bit more almost slick or mm. at least what you could class as entertaining. I thought a lot of it was quite good, but I didn't find it desperately entertaining because it was very, very serious. And, you know, she has a very grim life. You know, she loses her family and then she becomes a prostitute. And a drug addict. A drug addict. And homeless. Yeah, I mean, it's it's misery upon misery. And then you're saying that she trains herself to be an assassin, but actually a lot of it comes through um, Jude Law training her up. Actually, eerily, very similar to the Captain Marvel training that we saw with Brie Larson's character being trained up yes. by Jude Law. I don't know if he's making that a specialism now. But, um, you know, all, all that was kind of interesting. But then I was waiting for it to kick off and be really fun. And aside from a really good car chase, I didn't think it was really fun. Yeah, you never really get any sort of emotional payoff with it. She is just one thing, and that is rageful and grief-stricken. And she never seems to arrive at that destination from a character point of view. So you don't really feel satisfied by it. But I agree, the car chase is amazing. And of all the things in the film, I think that is actually genuinely groundbreaking. It felt very much like seeing Bourne for the first time because it's so differently shot. We're used to seeing car chases where you see the car sort of fishtailing around the corner and then you get a, a quick look at the inside of the car and then it's outside again. And this is just completely visceral and she is driving this car absolutely terrified and you've got the sort of passenger seat view and it's it is actually nerve jangling to watch. I've often noticed actually that watching action scenes when I get very involved with them it's sometimes that they are directed by a woman and I always think that's quite an intriguing thing to think about whether women bring something different to the action scenes. Do you think Reed Morano's gender she obviously directed some of the Handmaid Tale on TV do you think that sort of plays into the film in general? That's a very interesting point. I hadn't really thought about it. But yeah, the scene does play very much about how you would feel in the moment. Whereas maybe action from a male gaze is more about how impressive it is to the outsider. And the interior life is really explored by Reed in this particular scene. So maybe maybe there is something in that. I don't know. It's interesting. I'm going to start looking at that, Anna. But what I would say about Riven Section is that it's worth seeing if you're interested in the genre but it's a shame that possibly more budget and time wasn't spent on it and a little bit of humour to make it more entertaining. Do you agree? Yeah, I think it could have allowed her a little bit of triumph and a little bit of, yeah, enjoyment at some point because um, that would have given us that as well. So the rhythm section is available to download and keep now. And the next film we're going to talk about is a French film. It's called Who You Think I Am, Celle qui vous croyez. It stars the wonderful Juliette Binoche, and she plays 50-year-old Claire, who has a younger lover and decides to spy on him on social media by creating a fake profile. So she becomes Clara, a beautiful 24-year-old. And one of her, her boyfriend's friends, Alex, is instantly enamoured. And Claire, trapped by her avatar, falls madly in love with him online. So Jane, obviously everyone's a fan of, of Juliette Binoche and, and I thought she was terrific in this. And I thought it was a, an interesting blend of modern day stalker, dark comedy almost, that gets darker and darker. But then it raised some quite interesting questions about identity and sexuality and ageing within this slightly lurid format. Uh, did it resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, it did. Um, you could dismiss it as a purely a catfish story and this is just some woman entrapping somebody with a false avatar but really for me it was a lot more about 
how you become visible when you feel invisible. And she feels that she's no longer looked at or touched in a sexual way, that she, because she's hit 50 and she's a mum, she's become this sort of ignored person. And so I felt like it was a lot more about her sort of battling to get back that identity that she had had formerly at the age of 24. I mean, she even says at one point, I wasn't playing 24, I was 24. This really enlivens her, this whole conceit that she develops. And as you say, it's quite funny as well. There's a scene of her talking to her lover on the phone and she's driving round and round the car park, ignoring her children and not picking them up because she's so involved in this conversation. I just found it incredibly sort of emotionally involving and moving, actually. I really loved it. And it's directed by a man, Sefi Nabu, and I thought he did a really slick job with this. You're right. I thought it's kind of interesting because, yeah, on the surface it could appear like a kind of schlocky, almost a retro thriller like we used to see in the 90s of Fatal Attraction in the 80s and 90s. But it did take the time to explore that. And that, as a female viewer watching it, I found it increasingly interesting seeing it as a portrait of a woman who is still very beautiful but is losing her youthful beauty. But, I mean, surely that is exactly the kind of role that Juliette Binoche is fantastic at, wouldn't you say, Jane? Yeah, I mean, you know, she covers everything here from sort of the rage against the fallout of her marriage. She's obviously been divorced this absolute passion for this romance she's also you know just very authoritative in her job she's a a literary professor and she in a lovely touch that I like talks about dangerous liaisons as one of the texts um, which is essentially what she's doing she's crafting these letters in a modern era in a virtual world I just think she's absolutely amazing in this and it's not a spoiler to say that there's a sort of cliffhanger at the end and I'd actually like to see more. Where does this character go? What does she do next? Yes, I'd love a sequel to this film. Without spoilers, I did guess some elements which I think were meant to be twists, but I don't think that matters if you guess it. Mm. And I thought the casting generally was very good. Obviously, you know, she's the central character. But boy, did they find um, a very attractive young man in Francois Civil who plays Alex. And I think actually that's really important because, you know, you need to see what why she's so bewitched by him. But also the way they only really choose to reveal him at a certain point, I thought. And that, and that scene is done really, really well. Do you want to talk about the sex scene, by the way? By all means, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I was just going to say that it might sound that it's a little bit dry, people sort of typing loads of messages on Facebook and on phones. But actually, they managed to do a really raunchy um, phone sex scene that gives them and audiences uh, a little bit of release and is just beautifully done and, and really masterfully handled. I don't know about you, Anna, but I, I thought it was great. I thought it was very erotic and it also did something which probably not enough films do and it really focus on female pleasure. And I thought that was, yeah, I thought it was really well done. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting elements to this film, and that's certainly one of them. So I would recommend that one. And, and Who You Think I Am is currently on Curzon Home Cinema. So our final film that we want to speak about is Like a Boss. It stars Tiffany Haddish and Rose Byrne. It's a comedy, and they play friends who fall out after the rich and powerful Salma Hayek invests in their cosmetics company. Let's have a listen to a clip. We are two badass queens like those bitches who raised Wonder Woman. We've worked our asses off. We've opened up our own store. We're winning. We're $493,000 in debt. What the? Walk into the room. Mel play to Mia Carter. I'm Clara Luna. I am going to invest $1.7 million on you. <laughs> we would love a million dollars. But in my experience, business and friendship don't always mix. You don't have to worry. You're a pretty little head. My head is not little. It's just that my breasts are humongous. So, Jane, once again, this is a film I thought, great, this is going to be fun. This is my kind of cheese. Funny chick flick, great cast. Watch this at home. Oh, my gosh, I found it just, it was joyless, totally joyless affair. Yeah. And I was so disappointed. Tiresome, I found it. I had such high hopes because, obviously, we love Tiffany Haddish on Girls Trip. We love Rose Byrne in Bridesmaids. These two should be gold together. And, in fact, it just felt really a boring kind of film. It was just constant sort of potty talk that wasn't actually particularly clever or funny. And it didn't seem to bring anything new to that sort of genre at all. So yeah, I actually just couldn't wait for it to be over. And that's saying something when it's only 83 minutes long. 
It is amazing how slowly this film goes, and I, and it's it's shocking because it's the sort of thing that should whiz by, yeah. in fits of laughter. But I I may I probably laugh maybe three times. But they're straining for laughs every minute, so that's not a very high laugh count. And one of my bugbears in films often is when they kind of think, oh, it's got to appeal to women. So what kind of company could these women run? I know, makeup. I mean, not to say that that isn't a very good way to earn a living, but it just seems to happen so often in films scripted by men, as this is, and directed by a man. And it seems like a little bit of a cliche to sort of go, oh, yes, that's what women will be interested in. And also, it's this other thing. It's like whenever you watch a sort of rom-com where somebody works on a magazine or something, this idea of what the job is and what it really is they don't put any effort into making that seem at all realistic like this cosmetics company they run the ideas are rubbish and the cosmetics things that they're selling don't really feel like they would be massive hits so you don't feel like invested in it whatsoever um, as a viewer you don't feel like you believe in it at all and I know it's a heightened comedy and I know it's it's supposed to be silly but there's nothing to really grab hold of at all not even the girl's friendship not what they're trying to do with their jobs. Nothing about it really seemed to chime with me as realistic or something I could understand. I think it's difficult when you're using fictional companies. If it was a really good idea, it probably would have been done already. And that's the kind of problem. But also, yeah, it seemed like it had been written by someone who didn't know anything actually about makeup. Yeah, or... we're just like, oh, let's just, let's do it makeup. <laughs> That'll be covered. Yeah. So that's Like a Boss, which is also available to download and keep now, should you want to do it. <laughs> uh, the one saving grace of it, I thought, Anna, I don't know if you did, was Billy Porter, who was sort of uh, one of their employees and basically stole a film with one scene where he is told some bad news. And he does it in such a way and with such flair that actually it's a saving grace. That is actually one of the few funny scenes. So, yeah, well pointed out. And uh, Jane, before you go, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Little Women because we've launched our Little Women book club along with Sony and we're encouraging people to read the book in the run up to the digital release on the 11th of May. I know you're a fan of the film. Are you a fan of the book as well? I read the book so many times as a kid um, and I feel like it's one of those things that I know every beat of that story. But yet when I saw that film by Greta Gerwig, it felt fresh and new to me all over again. And I felt very invested in it all over again. So I think the film is absolutely brilliant. It's my number one of last year. Ah, well, no higher praise than that from Jane Crowther. Amazing. Yeah. Before you go, Jane, any messages for the Guzzle Film listeners when they're stuck at home in isolation? Um, I would say that I know a lot of people don't have all of the streaming platforms, but um, to remember that iPlayer, if you have that, is free and still has a massively good selection of films on there that you might have sort of ignored or not realised are on there. And at the moment, they've got some corkers like The Lost City of Zed, lots of films that you could watch and escape somewhere that isn't your lounge. I love that one too. Yeah, I included that in a piece I did for The Guardian about great movies to take you to another place. Yeah. Pure escapism. Yeah, great recommendation. And I'm actually doing daily film recommendations on my Twitter feed and my Facebook. And I'm trying to look for places like that where you can see a film completely free if you're in the UK at least. Yeah. So Jane, thank you so much for joining Girls on Film's Isolation Pod. Um, stay safe. And will you come back and see us again, please? Certainly will. Excellent. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to Girls on Film. Thank you to Hedda Archbold of HLA Productions for producing. Jane Long for audio producing, our intern Heather Dempsey. And Girls on Film has a Patreon page, so we'd love you to get involved. Go to patreon.com forward slash girls on film podcast. Follow us on Twitter at girls on film underscore pod and Instagram at girls on film underscore podcast. Please do subscribe and review us if you enjoyed this episode. And as another thank you for being a loyal listener, we have a special deal for you. You can get three months free subscription to the streaming service Mubi. Just go to mubi.com forward slash girls on film podcast. You've been listening to me, Anna Smith, and our guests, Carol Morley and Jane Crowther, plus our listeners, Laurie, Julia and Hannah. Stay safe and we will be back with more Girls on Film very soon. Bye.